Friends, if everyone would please take their seats. We're going to get started so we can maybe stay on schedule. Friends, Alona, would you close that door behind you, please? Thank you. Good afternoon, good afternoon. We hope everyone had a wonderful afternoon and a great breakout session. Happy to provide you with the opportunity to learn for the sake of learning. And so I don't see Edna, so I'm gonna take it away. Oh, there she is. Okay, so this afternoon, if you all will, Stop talking. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for your attention. We really appreciate that. Thank you very much. The doors are closed and we're going to continue our programming. Thank you very much. I'm going to introduce Madeline Gimbel, Vice Chair of Torah Fund. Thank you, Debbie. Good afternoon. I am Adeline Gimbel, current Torah Fund Vice Chair for Communications, and as of tonight, will be a member of the 2026-2029 Nominating Committee. I have been a member of Ahavat Achim Sisterhood since 1977, and a proud member of Southern Region. Today, I have been given the honor and distinct privilege of introducing our guest speaker, Rabbi Bradley Shavit Arson, to you. Most of us know Rabbi Arson, and if there are any who do not, you are in for a treat. Ra Rabbi Dr. Bradley Shavit Arson holds the Abner and Rosalind Goldstein, Goldstein, Dean's Chair of the Ziegler School of Rabbinic Studies and is Vice President of American Jewish University. He also serves as Dean of the Zacharias Franklin College in Potsdam, Germany. He is the author of 10 books, most recently, Renewing the Process of Creation, A Jewish Integration of Science and Spirit. In 2008, Rabbi Artson ordained Rabbi Gershom Sizomu, leader of the Abba Yudaya tribe, and was a part of a rabbinic delegation to Uganda to install him as the first African rabbi in the sub Saharan Africa. Rabbi Artson is married to Alana Shavit Artson, and they are the parents of two adult children. Rabbi Arson. Shalom, friends. Isn't it great to be together again? There's such a joy that comes from in-person, actual presence. There are conversations that happen in the hallway, at the tables, walking from one place to another that simply are impossible elsewhere. And I think that's not incidental to what we want to talk about right now, which is the passion of conservative Judaism, which is also then to talk about the challenges of conservative Judaism. We are a group of Jews who I think of as the Goldilocks Jews. That's too hot. That's too cold. 
This one is just right. And there are non-Goldilocks Jews out there. There are plenty of people whose happy space is in other ways of being Jewish. And it's a part of our way of being Jewish to celebrate their ways of being Jewish too. Because given that we are rooted in a historical understanding, and what I mean by that is that Judaism grows over time and that people make choices that help shape Judaism to continue to meet the needs of their communities, which means that Judaism is always local because what works in Miami may not be what works in Toronto, which may not be what works in Haifa. So different communities will make very different choices. They'll read things in very different ways. They'll also read things differently based on their temperament. We all know some people who just need clarity. Just tell me what to do and I'll do it. And that's their temperament in life. That's true when they cook in the kitchen. And it's true when they raise their children. And it's true when it comes to Musaf. And then there are people whose temperament is just, I don't really care about the details. I care about the spirit. And that's also true in the kitchen. And they don't do Musaf. One of the things that drew me to conservative Judaism, and I want to talk about this for a moment, is the recognition that it's okay that your Jewish expression is shaped by your temperament. It's shaped by your own history. It's shaped by the communities that you have moved through in your life. It's shaped by your vision of who you are and who you want to be. Because there are, as our tradition tells us, Shivim Panim la Torah. There are 70 ways you can be a Torah Jew. And we live in the age of the iPad and the iPhone. We're used to choosing what it is we want when we want. That's both a great strength and it's an enormous challenge. Because if you say that the choosing of figuring out what your Jewishness is going to look like is not just an isolated private decision. It's a decision that we shape for each other. We do it with the people we love in our houses, in our congregations, in our sisterhoods and brotherhoods, and in all of our lives, we do these things together. We make choices with each other and for each other. And that develops into a kind of communitarian expression that is going to change over time. Now, that means, among other things, and here I go back to our founding teachers, people like Zacharias Frankel in Germany, people like Solomon Schechter in New York, people like David Lieber in California. I think of them as the courageous giants who were willing to admit that Judaism is not a matter primarily of abstract principle. I want to say that again. Judaism is not primarily a matter of abstract principle. Right? It's not a philosophy any more than your marriage is a philosophy or your relationship with your children is a philosophy. It has a lot of ideas in it, most of which they argue with you about. You, you and I will talk when we're back in Los Angeles.
<laughs> it's always the hardest with the people who are your neighbors. Because ideas are what we derive out of life. Life is primary and ideas are how we reflect upon our life and then try to play them back into life to live life better. Experience comes first. Ideas come to explain the experience. And then armed with that explanation, we then experience again and then refine the ideas so that they can do a better job. That in a nutshell is the approach of conservative Judaism, that we make primary the experiences of the Jewish people. And then out of those experiences, we distill wisdom that allows us to deepen our experiences and to live better lives so that we thrive. Now, I'm not here calling for an open-ended free-for-all because to the extent that we want to identify ourselves as Jewish, then we have to consult what has Judaism said to other communities and in other times. And that means we are like a tree, always adding rungs to a trunk that is already rooted, already established. We're not interested in inventing a new religion. We're interested in pruning a beautiful tree and making that tree vibrant and attractive and healthy for those yet to come. So a confession, I grew up in a very anti-religious household. I grew up as an atheist. I grew up in San Francisco, which is a great place to be an atheist. You said yay a little too quickly. But if you're going to be an atheist, there's a lot to do in San Francisco. And I found religion in college. And what got me there was two different things. One was, I think, honestly, my sophomore year first semester, I was biologically primed for love. It's not a coincidence that I met God and Ilana the same semester. And I have been true to them in my way ever since. I'm not sure that Ilana would applaud that line. Actually, I'm not sure that God would applaud that line either. But I fell in love. That's not an idea. It's a relationship. I entered into a relationship with the cosmos through the distillation of everything good about the world, which is what I think of as God. And then I met her in the person of Ilana. And, and I was so alienated from things Jewish at the time that I thought Ilana, who came from an Israeli family, was a living encyclopedia of Jewish wisdom. She knew the difference between Sukkot and Shavuot without, without having to look it up. And I do want to say that it's a design flaw to name two holidays that start and end with the same letter. But my path to Judaism took a turn when I walked into my first conservative minion because I saw something I'd never seen before. I saw men and women 
arguing about Torah in a serious way. Instead of a sermon, the congregation had someone who did a presentation and then opened it up for argumentation. And to be in a room where modern people cared about this Iron Age text and knew something about it and had something to say and could offer readings that were rooted in the tradition but flowered into something new, I, I was blown away by that. I also had never been in a congregation where everybody knew all the melodies to all the prayers. That was a shocker. And, and I loved that they were willing to welcome a guy like me who knew none of it, a complete novice. I'll tell you how far I've come and, and I'm gonna tell you why I think this matters for us today. I was so excited. The rabbi said, you have to try out God to see if God works for you. There's not a neutral place to think about God from. So he said to me that I should go to the synagogue for two months because less than two months, I'll spend the whole time worrying about where do you stand? Where do you sit? When do you walk forward? When do you bow? Two months is enough time to get over that to decide if you like it or not. So I started to go and, and I fell in love with a place that thought it was worth singing at the top of their lungs and then arguing about what the Torah has to say for us now. And I have seen that in every conservative institution I have ever been to. So I mentioned, I'm a proud alumnus of the Jewish Theological Seminary. I never considered applying anywhere else because I knew I needed a place where ideas and passion were encouraged. And they were, I have lifelong friends from my time in rabbinical school, including teachers. So I wanna tell you though, we're in hard times. These are challenging times, right? Because the world around us has changed enormously. Let me give you a weird measure of how big the change is. If you go on YouTube, they have a channel where they have historical videos, meaning early, early film. You can watch I don't know, Theodore Roosevelt's inaugural speech, something. You can watch San Francisco a year before the earthquake. You can look at Paris in 1890 and see people walking around. The one that got my rabbinic attention was San Francisco in 1905, because all the women walking down Market Street had skirts down to the ground, up to the neck, and sleeves to here. Plus, they were all wearing hats. Every single woman. And every single man had a suit and a bowler cap. Imagine how easy it would be to be an Orthodox Jew. I'm not joking here you look like everybody else, right? Now, let me tell you, if you walk down Market Street, they don't all look like Orthodox Jews anymore, right? And that new normal is profoundly challenging. It's very challenging. How do we teach a balance of reverence for these ancient texts when, as the chancellor mentioned, they're extraordinarily problematic for those of us who are committed to gender diversity and gender equality. How do you translate the worldview of 2000 years ago, 500 years ago, into wisdom usable 
for today while acknowledging the challenges involved in that. I mentioned to some of you earlier, I listened to an amazing podcast called The Happiness Lab. If you haven't listened to it, I strongly encourage you. A professor at Yale University who noticed that levels of depression and anxiety among undergraduates is at an all-time high. And she decided to do something about it, so she enlisted psychology. She brought together studies of what actually makes people happy and found over and over and over again that it's not how we spend our time. Our brains lie to us. They make us think that certain things will make us happy when in fact they don't. So she offered this class and 1,200 people enrolled. Then she offered it online and 300,000 people took the course. Then she created the podcast. And she talks about in this age of depression and anxiety exacerbated by COVID and our forced isolation and by the rabid partisanship in which people place their own particular ideas about politics over the well-being of the nation. And that is a nonpartisan accusation because unfortunately it describes a lot of people across the spectrum. Right? But in such an age, people find themselves terrified, alone, and they don't remember how to get out. Now that's a singular challenge to conservative Judaism. We are the Judaism that is based on community. We are the Jew, that's not to say, I wanna hasten to, that's not to say other denominations don't care about community, but it's not central to them as it is to us, right? We get together, even if we don't agree about whether you're gonna say this prayer this way or that prayer that way, right? We still get together. And it has been as communities that we've made our decisions. Look at the structure of our movement. And it's a structure in which Jewish practice is not put to a popular vote. At some point, it's decided by the authorities, which is to say the rabbis, who are the only ones who are actually elected by the Jewish people. Right? So the people have an enormous say because they get to pick the rabbis, but the rabbis have an enormous say because they get to define the parameters of legitimacy, which is to say, how do you unpack the Torah for our time and our community? And there was a time where that kind of communitarian spirit was the dominant voice of American life. And so no surprise, our heyday numerically was in that time when America was most bipartisan and most communitarian. And I am not saying that to idealize that period of time. The reasons we were so communitarian and so unified is because we were scared to death of nuclear annihilation and we hadn't noticed how much racism there was yet not to mention sexism. So it was a paradise for us white straight guys. And y'all mostly went along. As we've recognized the diversity of human beings and of human experiences, and we valorize that diversity, our way of being Jewish becomes harder. It requires knowing a lot. The Talmud itself says it's easy to just say no, right? If you're going to say yes to a question, you have to actually know something about the subject, right? So conservative Judaism takes an enormous amount of knowledge, 
That's one problem. It's based on a communitarian ideology where we put the group ahead of our personal interests sometimes. That's very unpopular these days. And then I want to say, so far have been, this is Brad being safe and timid. Here comes the real Brad. We've also become really stodgy. We are stodgy and often boring. That's less appealing than you might think. So part of the job that I know we do at Siegler and they do at JTS and we're doing at Geiger and at Schechter and the Seminario is to teach our young rabbinical candidates that one can love Torah, love mitzvot, love the tradition, and not be boring. It is hard, but it is possible. And we need to unite in this regard. I, I have been a lover of Women's League for my entire rabbinic career. The, the sisterhood in Mission Viejo was, I will argue to this day, the best sisterhood ever. They tolerated a young rabbi who knew very little but had a lot of enthusiasm. They taught me most of what I know. They would support me and host me in whatever I needed. They would chew me out whenever I needed it. But in a very loving way, they were incredible. And I want sisterhood to thrive. But that means part of the work you can do is the holy work you've been doing of supporting our rabbinical schools. And for that, I deeply thank you. But if there's to be a passionate conservative Judaism, then I need to invite you to the table to help us rethink what can our communities do to convey that passion? How do we teach people that you can innovate in a traditional way, that you can do it based on the sources and loving the tradition? Great jazz is not a rejection of classical music. You have to know classical music cold to do jazz well. And that's what I'd like us to do together. I'd like us to enter into the age in which the jazz of Judaism is unleashed, which means we need to learn Torah better. We need to pray deeper from our hearts than we ever had. We need to sing with more gusto. We need to find out what is preventing our children and grandchildren from wanting to be in our spaces. And then we need to create the spaces they want to be in, even if that means we can't be in them. But here's what I want to say by way of closing, and then I'm open to any comments you want to make. I have long thought, and I continue to believe, that the ideas that launched conservative Judaism remain the best cluster of ideas in the history of the Jewish people. If you read the great Jewish thought leaders of the 1880s to the 1920s, most of them you won't be able to get through and you will find yourself, if you're still awake, in disagreement. But if you read Zacharias Frankel, if you read Solomon Schechter, it's as if they are speaking to our communities. Their relevance is extraordinary. And here I want to say purely in envy. The Orthodox are great at celebrating their rebellion, And we're terrible at it. There are great conservative sages who were saints. I'll mention two of my favorites. Dr. Simon Greenberg of Blessed Memory who was both a vice chancellor of the Jewish Theological Seminary and the founding president of American Jewish University and a man beloved to me. He was a walking chassid. And I don't mean by chassid, long locks, singing and dancing on the street. That would have been anathema to him. But his goodness, his decency, 
his passion for mitzvot and his attention to the individual in front of him was unequaled. The second is the rabbi whose chumash you read every week, what I call the Lieber chumash. David Lieber, New Yorker, trained at JTS, came out to the West Coast. His college roommate, his, his rabbinical school roommate was a man named Gerson Cohen, who also achieved some great fame in Judaism, right? And Dr. Lieber invented a way of Jewish that was authentic, grounded in the sources, and emotionally rich. I remember my first few years at Sinai, he always sat in the far back right of the main sanctuary, always, just beaming support. Can we do that? Can we be the pioneers that our ideas deserve? that our relationships deserve, that our community deserves. We cannot afford to continue as we have been going. But we have the resources in our God, in our Torah, in our tradition, and in each other to tweak the Judaism that can speak for the next generation. And we dare not step away from it. Shalom. Thank you, Rabbi Artson. I guess I'm going to have to listen to more classical music. <laughs> <laughs> You're free to take some questions. Yes. Yes. First of all, I've been spending hours listening to the Happiness Lab, and if you think I'm going to just give it away now. All right, well, the top few things is one, once you've made enough money that you have taken care of your basic needs, more money will not make you happier. Multimillionaires think that if they only had 200 million more, that would do it, but it doesn't. So don't put your energy there. Instead of scrolling on your phone when there's a free moment, Think about who you could text, or even better, call, or even better, visit, right? I have friends who live kitty corner to me, and I will walk over on a Saturday afternoon, and I knock on their door, and when their son answers the door, I say, can Steve or Lillian come out to play? Don't spend time with aggravating people who don't make you happy. You don't get the time back and they won't be less annoying. There's a reason why the Torah says, love your neighbors as you love yourself. We're very good to our neighbors and we're crappy to ourselves. So if someone came to you going through a really hard time, you wouldn't say to them, well, the reason you're having a hard time is because you're miserable and nobody likes you. You would say that must be really hard and I understand and you don't deserve that. And what can we do to help? So when you come to yourself with those feelings, you need to practice acting like you love yourself and be your own friend get enough sleep, give more to rabbinical schools. That's not the happiness lab, but that, that works. You should do that too. Find ways to attend to your spirit. And now I'm gonna say something you don't think a rabbi would say. For me, that involves davening three times a day, putting on tefillin in the morning. And if that works for you, then you should do it. 
bei dem Winter sind. Don't. Right? The way, by the way, conservative rabbis admit that they already know that is they violate halacha every single Saturday. Here's what they say. They say to you, we're going to rise and say the silent Amidah right now. If the words of the prayer book speak to you, that's great. And if not, feel free to close the book and just say the words of your heart. That's lovely advice that violates Jewish law. Every single week, their portion in the world to come gets smaller and smaller and smaller, but it's still psychologically astute, right? So make time to, to meditate if that's your style or to dance. Or you know how Heschel talked about protesting was you got it now? Don't don't explain. The there are a lot of things that make your feet pray. If it's gardening, if it's walking on the beach, if it's holding hands with someone and sitting in a rocking chair. Find what is your feet's prayer and do it. Make time for it. These are things that are not good ideas unless you do them. None of these are things, because I didn't tell you anything you don't know. Eat healthy, right? I'm, I'm not saying anything you don't know. I'm just telling you things we don't do. We don't prioritize. For, first, uh, okay, confession, and then I'll go for the you have next, next comment. Um, one of the ways I've been making myself crazy by administering a rabbinical school is before I go to bed, I check my email to make sure there's no crisis. You are so judgy. I reveal a personal failing and that's what I get from Women's League? Jeez. And then I wake up in the morning and the first thing I do is I check my email. Well, I don't do that anymore. Right? Yay. Happiness Lab. At nine o'clock, I close my computer. And Alana and I sit together and we talk or I'll watch a television show or whatever. And in the morning, I get up, I daven, I do an hour on the elliptical. And then when I have my cup of coffee, I check the email. Whatever disastrous, nasty note someone sent me at 11.30 the night before can wait till 9.30 the next morning. I don't have your discipline. <laughs> I don't either. <laughs> yes. There's a mic. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you for speaking today. And your analogy concerning the conserving conservative tree trunk was absolutely beautiful. And your final request to encourage our children and grandchildren to join the um, to join our movement also resonated with me. I've had the honor of serving as student and youth chairperson for the past years under Debbie, and with the guidance of Debbie Goldich. You have a great teacher. I did, and I do. Um, in the, as part of my job, at Rabbi Ellen had received during the pandemic a request from some students to have a representative from Women's League serve on a panel on Zoom from Yale University. So she referred it to me. I got in touch with them and things seemed a little strange. I couldn't really make heads or tail out of it. So I did my due diligence and I looked it up, the students, and they were the officers of the Yale Republican Club. They assumed that we were conservative. So, and I have talked to, I have talked, spoken to Debbie about this. And I'm wondering if that's turning off some of our young people, perhaps, who might be that we accept. So, um, thank you. Thank you. That's a good question. I will. I will just here say that I'm answering only for myself and myself alone. No failing corporation eliminated the problem by changing their name. 
I do not think the name is the problem because let's say we changed our name to Masorti, for example. I don't think that would have them like flocking down the street because of the name. You know, Reconstructionist is a catchy name and you don't see their places packing them in. Um, so I think it's not the name. I think, you know, that is a challenge. And, you know, you should, when you get a call from a group, you should explain to them that it's not that kind of conservative, um, just so there are no surprises. Um, although we welcome those kinds of conservative too. Um, but I think the issue is deeper than that. What, what, look, we, we just, um, completed a process of utterly reinventing our rabbinical school curriculum. And I know that JTS has launched a similar process in which we're, we have to be very honest about what invisible impediments are in their way that we didn't even know we're putting there. Things that might have been okay 20 years ago, but are now stopping talented, interested people from applying to our programs and see, and stopping them from seeing themselves as rabbis, right? And we had to be ruthlessly honest with that. And I'm sure JTS will be ruthlessly honest and then come up with a very different solution because there's more that none of us know how to solve. I mean, we're all just trying to figure it out. But but it starts with real deeper honesty, and I don't think the name is the problem. Yeah. Rabbi Recker. Hi, Marsha Ramey from Southern Region. So um, in Nashville, the Jewish community is growing actually by leaps and bounds. Yes. So, uh, but not in the movement. These are uh, most of the people moving are unaffiliated and choose would prefer to remain so. Uh, grassroots organizations are just popping up. The casual Jewish contact is very low barrier. So it, it's it's a struggle of, you know, I certainly want to be part of those organizations and help them along their Jewish journey too. But when they openly say in their rules, well, some of our outings will be, you know, dairy or vegetarian, but some of them are going to include, you know, pork wrapped things slathered in grease. It's like, well, are you even Jewish? I mean, is this Jewish? So I guess, how does that fit in with the whole, you know, struggle with the seminaries? Okay, so one of my more, um... I don't know, an idea that I play with is what if for a while we thought about denominations as pertaining to institutions, but not to individuals, right? I don't mean we're all Jewish in the way Chabad means we're all Jewish, because Chabad says there's only one way to be Jewish and everything else is in Judaism. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying we're all being the best Jews we know how to be. And then different institutions affiliate in different ways because that cluster represents where the bulk of their people sit and they gain strength in numbers. So I wonder if we could help liberate our conservative institutions from an all or nothing mentality, right? What would it look like? But but now that's that I'm not I'm not putting the responsibility on the rabbi alone here. You can't take an overworked, understaffed synagogue crew and tell them to do a good job of outreach. Right? What you have to do, and where Chabad is brilliant, is they have 10 underemployed rabbis, all of whom are trying to fill their time. So what if conservative institutions got together in Washington, DC, they started a program where they brought in a rabbi who doesn't have responsibilities to a particular congregation. They just have responsibility to sit in coffee shops all day long and to meet young people and to offer classes and to do learning and stuff. But, but that often helps bring people when they're at the right stage of life back into a synagogue where that's most likely to happen. 
So I think we have allowed our buildings to define our identity. And buildings do not do that. People do. Relationships do. So let's think about what conservative... You agree? 100%. I've been talking a long time before I got you here. Let's refocus on what are the kinds of relationships we want to foster and not so much on can we get them to walk into this set of doors because the doors don't matter, the room doesn't matter. I mean, it does for people like me, but I'm a fossil. You, you, I told, I, I'm a member of ICAR. I told Rabbi Browse, the day you start designing ICAR programs to make me happy is the day you start to shut down, All right? So let's find out what gets people doing Jewish together and not worry about where they start. Because here's the thing, if they start studying Torah, Tanakh, Midrash, Talmud, over bacon sandwiches, which by the way, from my childhood, I can tell you are delicious. Do I have time to tell them one story? Quick story. So my father passed away last year at the age of 93. I'm very sad about that. Thank you for your condolences. My dad for his entire adult life had the same breakfast every single morning. And the last 15 years of his life, his son, the head of a conservative rabbinical school, would call him up on the way to work and say, how you doing, dad? And he'd say, great. I had a great breakfast today. And I would say, really, dad, what did you have? And dad would say, I had eggs and toast. And I would say, and what else did you have, dad? And then dad would say, bacon and it was really good as if i didn't remember from the day before the day before the day before let's focus and give ourselves permission to let people participate at the level they find comfortable and not worry about where their journey has to wind up let's get them excited about taking the next jewish step and then they will worry about the step after that. Thank you very much. God bless. I just want to ask you, first I want to thank you. But I just want to ask you, was I right? Was, is, was he not a treat? <laughs> Thank you, Rabbi. Just a couple short announcements before we do Mincha. First of all, Rabbi, I think we are all attending to our spirit by just being here because this is unbelievable. Being together, you are right, was the medicine we all needed from the pandemic. So thank you. Okay, we are going to have Minka. We have women here that are saying Kaddish. We need to respect them. This, these are our sisters in our community. So please stay for Minka. We are going to change the time of dinner to 630 because we're running a little late and there's something before that some of us need to do. So keep that in mind. If you see people that aren't here, please let them know. So with that, Gilda, Gilda, Gilda Zucker will be leading us in Minka. Thank you. <laughs>